Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Almasian. I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement and Participation at the College of Nursing. To our returning attendees, welcome back to our reunion festivities. For anyone joining us for the first time today, we also welcome you to the final event of our Alumni Reunion 2020 celebration. I'm very pleased to be introducing our speakers for what I'm sure will be a very interesting and timely lecture looking at the experiences of nursing of nurses during the flu pandemic of 1918 and also drawing on some comparisons to the pandemic facing our world today. And now let's welcome our presenters for this afternoon's lecture. Dr. Arlene Keeling is the Centennial Distinguished Professor of Nursing Emerita at the University of Virginia. She's the award-winning author of Nursing and the Privilege of Prescription, 1893 to 2000. She is also the former director of the Eleanor Crowder Fioring Center for Nursing Historical Inquiry at the University of Virginia. She's the past co-chair of the American Academy of Nursing's expert panel on nursing history and past president of the American Association for the History of Nursing, a role through which she inspired colleagues across the pond to develop a European Association for the History of Nursing. Dr. Gwyneth Milbrath is a clinical assistant professor at UIC College of Nursing. She's also director of the Midwest Nursing History Research Center here at UIC. And I'll note that Dr. Keeling also sits on the advisory board for the center. Uh, Dr. Milbrath's, Milbrath's historical research is focused on the roles of nurses during wars and disasters. She's completed studies on nursing during the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and as you're about to hear, the role of student nurses on military bases during the pandemic flu outbreak of 1918. She's also currently collecting oral histories, journals, and social media posts about the COVID-19 pandemic. I introduce to you Dr. Arlene Keeling and Dr. Gwyneth Milbrath. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. Okay, is that good? Everyone can see the screen? Okay, great, thank you for the thumbs up. So today, uh, Dr. Keeling and myself are going to be talking about Illinois nurses on the front line, the influenza epidemic from 1918 and 1919. Um, the often spoken quote, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it, has resonated throughout history, although for many, it has never felt more true than it does today. To many historians, the deadly SARS-CoV-2 virus that is responsible for the global COVID-19 pandemic feels a lot like a song reprise you hear in a musical. It echoes back to the moment when you first heard the powerful melody, but is repackaged in a way that brings those memories to a higher level. COVID-19 is the reprise of the 1918 flu pandemic that nobody wanted, but that does not mean that we cannot learn from the successes and the failures of the past. Of course, 100 years of improvements in science, medical care, sanitation, and indoor environments can certainly give today's society an advantage our ancestors did not have, but the tools we have to prevent infections and mitigate risk are largely unchanged. Today, Dr. Arlene Keeling and myself have the honor of speaking to you about the roles of nurses during the 1918 flu pandemic, mostly here in Illinois. I will start by discussing the general development of the flu and its impact on military bases and how the student nurses from the Army School of Nursing cared for the sick and highly contagious soldiers. Dr. Keeling will discuss the impact of the 1918 flu pandemic in Chicago and the role of the Chicago Visiting Nurses Association in treating and preventing the flu in many of Chicago's most vulnerable neighborhoods. The 1918 flu pandemic, also known as the Spanish flu, arrived February 1918. What is now known to be a version of the H1N1 influenza virus, this flu infected about one third of the world's population in four waves, causing between 17 and 15 million deaths worldwide and is one of the deadliest pandemics in human history. This particular flu outbreak was unique in that it caused a higher than expected mortality rate for young adults rather than the very old or very young, which is a more typical pattern. This was compounded by the fact that most of the young men in the US and Western Europe were fighting on unsanitary, harsh battlefields or encamped in crowded barracks at military bases across the US. 
To complicate the situation, several thousand of the world's top doctors and nurses were serving in Europe and su uh, to support the troops abroad, leaving few to cope with a major epidemic at home, including the United States. Although the exact origins of the flu are unknown, some of the earliest cases were reported in Camp Funston, Kansas, a large US Army base mobilizing troops to fight abroad. It was in this context that the newly admitted students at the Army School of Nurses find themselves struggling to leverage what little experience and knowledge they have acquired to help their patients and protect themselves from the flu. The Army School of Nursing students arrived shortly before the flu and were just beginning their training when the epidemic hit the encampment. The flu epidemic peaked between September 15th and November 1st, 1918 at Fort Riley, which was part of the large Camp Funston and the location of the Medical Corps. During this time period, over 15,000 were treated at camp and base hospitals. Of those treated for influenza, 17% developed pneumonia and 30%, 36% of those that developed pneumonia died from the flu. The vast majority of those dying were not the very young or the very old, but strong, young, healthy men and a few women that were preparing to fight for and serve their country. Almost one out of every four people stationed at the camp developed influenza, and the overall death rate was 6.2%. Considering that the normal capacity for the base hospital was 3,068 beds, the medical department had to find creative ways to treat five times its capacity without overcrowding the wards and potentially worsening transmission and exposure. Additional bed space was created by putting patients on the porches and corridors of the convalescent sections of the hospital, as well as using the porches of barracks and the YMCA building. This allowed regular airflow, decreasing the risk of transmission to hospital staff, nurses and physicians, as well as other patients. Despite these measures, the epidemic worsened and eventually peaked the first weeks of October with 5,666 patients being hospitalized on October 8th alone, putting the medical department at 185% of its capacity. Colonel Frick, the commanding officer of the medical department at Fort Riley sent a telegram to the US Surgeon General requesting additional graduate nurses to supply the base hospital and emergency hospital, reporting 37 nurses were out sick that day. The acting Surgeon General responded by sending 20 nurses from Letterman General, General Hospital in San Francisco. However, it would take several days for these reinforcements to arrive. By October 19th, the hospital census was 3,829 patients with 49 nurses, three aides, and three students unable to work due to illness. Assuming the remaining nurses work 12-hour shifts every day, the nurse to student uh, each nurse had, and student had a minimum of 31 patients, many of whom were severely ill. This dire need for nurses was not unique to Fort Riley, as military encampments and communities across the country were in desperate need of nurses and trained medical assistants to comfort and treat the millions suffering from influenza, including at Camp Grant in Illinois. The largest of the original training sites for the newly founded Army School of Nursing was located at Camp Grant uh, near Rockford, Illinois, approximately 80 miles northwest of the city of Chicago. 35 students arrived at Camp Grant eager and willing to learn nursing while serving their country. They, along with their classmates across the country, were issued light blue student uniforms with a white collar, white cuffs, and a black tie. The students were affectionately known as the Bluebirds at bases across the country due to their blue uniforms and enthusiastic attitudes. Despite being, uh, despite being often young novice nurses, the students at Camp Grant took their nursing and military training very seriously. Although the students were considered civilians, this small detail did not exempt them from following military rules, regulations, and the military lifestyle. Student nurses were provided three meals per day in their student nurse quarters and were subject to weekly inspections, nightly curfews, and strict attendance policies. Students were required to always be in uniform when in the hospital buildings, the nurses' quarters, and outdoor uniforms when off base visiting nearby Rockford. The first two to three months of nurse training for the Bluebirds was spent practicing military drills, following their structured curriculum in the classroom, 
nursing on the wards alongside faculty and graduate nurses, or exploring the base and the surrounding area. However, this routine was short-lived as the nation was called to respond quickly to the escalating threat of the influenza uh, epidemic. On September 28, 1918, men from the Central Officers Training School at Camp Grant began to exhibit signs of the flu, mostly, most likely fever, cough, chills, and fatigue. The flu had already arrived at several other camps in the US, including Camp Devens, Massachusetts, where a small number of men had recently transferred from the New England Army base to Camp Grant. 70 men sought treatment for their care that evening, and by morning, the medical officers recognized the potential for an epidemic amongst the camp. Soldiers, with certain exceptions, were quarantined to camp and visitors, except those on urgent business, were forbidden. Social gatherings on base, such as the theater and ice cream parlor were closed and ventilation was maintained as much as possible in the barracks and treatment areas. As soon as a new case was suspected, a mask was placed to cover the patient's nose and mouth and they were transported from the barracks to the hospital or infirmary for isolation and treatment. Prevention continued to be a priority at Camp Grant as this highly contagious virus was infecting otherwise healthy young people very aggressively. Soldiers were instructed on the dangers of transmitting the virus through spitting, coughing, or sneezing around others, and all were required to wear masks when transporting or visiting the base hospital. Patients were instructed to use their own bedding and clothing at the hospital, and once patients were discharged, the bedding straw was burned and blankets and bed sacks were aired in the sun for several hours to try to decontaminate the linens. Every effort was made to relieve overcrowding in the barracks and hospital, including housing men in large tents outside. However, as fall turned to winter in Northern Illinois, the tents would be inadequate protection against the coming bitter cold and wind of the upper Midwest US. Camp Grant's base hospital continued to struggle to keep up with the demand for services due to the epidemic. The need for help in the hospitals was so acute that the classes for the nursing students were suspended and students worked on the floor alongside the graduate nurses. The hospital expanded from 10 occupied beds to over 4,000 within a six day period. The sick were placed on porches in evacuated barracks and on the uh, adjacent sanitary train to try and mitigate overcrowding and cross contamination between patients, but it was nearly impossible. Every available space was used, including the student's classroom, which was often used to house sick nurses. The base hospital laundry had to partner with local labs to test the overwhelming number of specimens for culture. I'm sorry, the base hospital laboratory. Um, at its peak from September 26 to September 29, 1918, Camp Grant had over 3,500 new cases of influenza averaging almost 900 new cases per day in a population of around 40,000 people. The army sent so many telegrams informing families of death or serious illness that they had to set up a separate information bureau to triage the deluge of te telegrams, calls, and visitors. Every effort was made to afford men with at least 100 square feet of space in the barracks and some men, primarily black men, were placed in tents outside to try to relieve overcrowding. Blacks were treated as second-class soldiers compared to whites of equal or lesser military standing and were housed separately from white men. The tents were no doubt undesirable, cold, and less comfortable than the barracks. However, these tents may have been the primary reason for the lower infection rate among black soldiers compared to white soldiers. This confused the medical officers, as most whites believed that Blacks were more susceptible to contagious diseases at the time and expected a higher rate of influenza infection in the Black population. Most likely, the segregation from white men and sleeping in the outdoor quarters, allowing continuous fresh air to circulate, decreased the incidence of the flu in the Black population, despite whites receiving more medical attention and resources. Camp Grant authorized approximately 150 local nurses to assist with the emergency during its peak. However, the nurses were not immune to the flu and many fell ill. During an inspection by Colonel Connor of the Medical Corps in, on October 7th, of the 394 nurses in the camp, 71 or about 20% were ill. The students were also suffering. For example, at Camp Sherman, Ohio, 
Of the 33 students training, as many as 25 students fell ill during October uh, 1918, with as many of eight, as 18 out sick on the same day. Pictured here is the original logbook from the Army School of Nursing, noting the students that are out ill and unable to be assigned to duty. The rapid influx of patients, including nurses and medical uh, members of the medical department, and the sudden expansion of hospital beds severely exacerbated the pre-existing nursing shortage on military bases. When Annie Goodrich, Dean of the Army School of Nursing, was informed of the severe influenza emergency on military bases, she took immediate action. Rather than removing students from the military bases, she sent a telegram to 500 accepted students asking the students if they were willing to serve at the military camp despite the risk of exposure and overcrowded quarters. 90% of the applicants responded and were quickly assigned to the military camps for training and to assist. Newly arrived students were given instruction in, quote, a few simple procedures and necessary precautions and were gladly assigned to the duty on infected wards. This dire need for nurses was felt around the world in civilian and military circles alike. Despite little to no experience in nursing, the students of the Army School of Nursing worked alongside the Army nurses to provide the best care that they could to the sick soldiers. Students often were charged with caring for sick nurses or each other. However, oftentimes there was little that the nurses could do to fight against the flu, especially for those developing pneumonia. Constance Shields, a student at Camp Grant, died on October 6th, 1918. Additionally, 11 of the 81 medical officers at Camp Grant fell ill and three civilian and three army nurses died. At Fort Riley, Gilberta Durland remembers, quote, the ambulance made its daily or semi-daily trip to our quarters and carried off sometimes one, two, and three of our members. Four of our little band never returned. Our acquaintance with them was brief, but still our work had, in even so short a time, drawn us closely to one another and they were greatly loved and missed by all. Three students lost their lives at Fort Riley. Across all the training sites for the Army School of Nursing, 24 students died during their training, with over half of them dying between October and December of 1918. By the end of October, the worst of the epidemic had passed and the medical department shifted their focus to recovering convalescent soldiers and minimizing the risk of reinfecting or newly infecting others. Of the 40,678 troops stationed at Camp Grant, 10,739 contracted influenza with 1,060 deaths, resulting in a case mortality rate of 9.87%. Undoubtedly, the physical strain of the nursing work during an epidemic and the emotional strain of caring for their sick and dying classmates and mentors was significant. However, the nurses work, quote, proved so satisfactory that the head nurses frequently requested student assistant in the preference to that of graduates. There is an abundant evidence that the students rendered a definitive, a definite service. The flu continued to travel along railroad and supply lines from military base to base and into the nearby communities. As the flu ravaged Camp Grant in Rockford, nearby metropolis Chicago was fighting its own battle against this invisible enemy. As the month of September progressed, the flu spread to Chicago, a bustling metropolis of 2.7 million people and a city teeming with immigrants living in crowded ghetto neighborhoods. As a major railway hub and near to Camp Grant, the city was in the perfect location to attract the pandemic. And early on, cases erupted at Northwestern University. On September 16, Chicago's health commissioner, John Robertson, made flu a reportable disease, but took no further action. Schools remained open and Robertson declared that he had the virus, quote, well in hand. However, by September 21, the city noted an increase in deaths due to acute respiratory illness. And Robertson took a few steps toward action, asking the chief of police to have his officers, quote, stop all persistent sneezers and coughers who did not cover their faces with handkerchiefs. Those violators who promised to obey instructions in the future would be let go, but anyone who gave the officer a hard time would be arrested. 
given a lecture on the dangers of flu and sent before a judge. Robertson also warned theater managers to ensure patrons used handkerchiefs or he would shut down their establishments. He ordered churches, schools, theaters, restaurants, and streetcars to open their windows. For the time being, however, that was all he did. No closure orders were given until mid-October. The cases, however, continued to rise and soon hospitals were inundated. Next slide. On October 1, Cook County Hospital reported 260 cases, 60 of which had arrived that day. It was only then that Robertson ordered, quote, virtual quarantine for every case of influenza in the city, commanding victims to go home and stay there. On October 2, the city reported that the capacity of hospitals was nearly exhausted. The city had 370 new cases and 14 deaths. By October 10, Chicago was reporting 1,421 cases and over 120 deaths. Many patients would have to be cared for at home by visiting nurses. The VNA had been providing care for the poverty-stricken immigrants living in the city's ghettos since the organization was formed in 1889 at the height of the women's club movement. In 1918, the VNA under the direction of Superintendent Edna Foley had 93 nurses working out of 10 substations throughout the city. Among these were the Central Free Dispensary located at Rush Medical College, the Dearborn Dispensary at Northwestern, others in Seward Park and Hamlin Park, and Westfall in the South Chicago area. The remaining ones were on North Pauline Street and Hull House. Using these stations as places where they could receive messages, restock their nursing bags, and contact physicians, the nurses worked long days as the flu ravaged the Italian, German, Irish, and Polish ghettos. There, the streets were expressibly dirty, with hundreds of houses unconnected to street sewers. Assistant VNA Supervisor Mary Westfall described what was happening, writing, the houses in this area are very close together and many families live under one roof. The people watched at their doors and windows, beckoning for the nurses to come in. One day a nurse who started out with 15 patients to see saw nearly 50 before midnight. Sometimes before getting out of her first case, the nurse was surrounded by people asking her to go with them to see other patients. Physicians could not get around to all the people needing them. It was impossible to get orders and consequently the nurse had to be many things to all people. The Chicago visiting nurses had a well-established network to whom they could turn for support. And working with the local Red Cross Society, the VNA decided that they would try to cover all families for whom it was impossible to get private duty nurses or aides. Critical to that support was progressive era reformer, James Adams, a founding member of the VNA and director of Hull House, one of America's first settlement houses. Located at 800 South Halstead in the immigrant slum district, the settlement's purpose was to ameliorate the effects of poverty in a city that was subject to an overwhelming influx of European immigrants. Usually the settlement workers provided social and educational opportunities for recent immigrants. During the flu epidemic, however, the contributions were much more basic. As Mary Westfall said, District 8, or as we know it better, Hull House, helped us wonderfully, supplying warm gowns, baby clothes, bed linens when needed, soup and other foods for families that could not provide it for themselves. Other nursing organizations also helped. Nurses from the Infant Welfare Society covered the families who were already registered with them, while 50 nurses from the Municipal Tuberculosis Sanatorium took over the districts located near their dispensaries, providing care for over 1,000 patients during the epidemic. In addition, the VNA relied on help from volunteer nurses' aides, 
recently trained women who trained in home nursing courses under the Town and Country Red Cross Society. Meanwhile, <clears throat> denied entry into most nursing organizations because of racial discrimination, Black nurses from Provident Hospital's Visiting Nurse Association, begun in 1897, worked alongside physicians in the African-American neighborhoods. There, like their white counterparts, they provided skilled nursing care to patients in their homes. Key to the nurses' work was the use of gauze masks, mandated by the National Red Cross in an attempt to prevent caregivers from contracting the deadly disease. According to Chicago Red Cross's chapters, instructions for nurses, attendants, and aides to caring for patients suffering from flu, gauze masks were to be worn, quote, constantly in congested homes when doing anything for the patient. According to Edna Foley, we began by using a stitched mask with four strings. This involved carrying two bags, one for fresh and one for soiled masks and a supply of about 16 masks for each nurse. It also required someone to boil these masks and dry them daily. And before long, we gave up. We conceived the idea of folding squares of gauze on the bias, making strips of six inches thicknesses and tying them over our face or pinning them to our hair. Each one of these improvised masks was folded in a paper towel and after the mask was discarded, it was burned. In addition to the hassle factor, the masks had other negative attributes, one of which was that they frightened patients and their families. According to Mary Westfall, at first the gowns and masks which all the nurses wore frightened the people, and several women helpers simply left the houses on seeing the nurses so dressed up. Gradually, they became accustomed to them, and in many homes, we trained the husband or wife or whoever was supplementing our care to wear the gowns and masks. In reality, the masks were the least of the problems. Supplementing the nurses' care was soon the critical issue. As the epidemic wore on and nurses' home visits increased from 12,000 to 25,000 in the month of October. By mid-October, the Chicago Daily Times was reporting, quote, the limit of nursing service has been passed in Chicago. As a result, on October 16, the Chicago chapter of the Red Cross issued an appeal for volunteers, writing in the newspapers, every woman who has ever had any nursing experience of any kind, and you can go even inside the home of a neighbor and cook a meal or do the family marketing, can join the Red Cross right now. More women must help in each neighborhood to stamp out influenza. The Chicago Tribune also published an appeal for help, including an example of how one woman had done so. Miss Lyman visited a house on the west side where she expected to find a mother ill with influenza. Here is what she actually did find. Mother bedridden, helpless, fever 105, baby 10 months old starving, nothing to eat since Monday, daughter three years old, fever of 104, son four years old, fever of 103. Mrs. Walton gave first aid, stocked up the house with supplies, procured ice water, set the house in order, telephoned for a doctor and a nurse, and was preparing to depart when a man stumbled in the door. He was the husband of the woman and the father of the three children. He himself had been out seeking in vain for a doctor. Miss Walton discovered that he registered a fever of 103, whereupon he was put to bed in the dining room on a new mattress stretched across the table. Next slide. The scene was typical of what nurses were finding on their rounds. And in some cases, the basic nursing care provide proved life-saving. In one of our Bohemian families, six people living in three basement rooms were ill. The mother and father we sent to county hospital and the 12 year old girl helped us care for the other children. All in this family recovered. That recovery depended on good nursing care. Nurses and their assistants gave skilled nursing care, changing linens, bathing patients and dressing them in pneumonia jackets, 
providing soup and other liquid nourishments, and providing patients symptomatic relief with Dover's powder, aspirin, and Listerine throat gargles, along with cough syrups and other household remedies. Despite the nurse's efforts, death was all too frequently the outcome. On October 1st, the city reported 374 cases and 14 deaths, 45 more deaths from pneumonia. According to the VNA report, in one of our Polish families, we lost five out of seven in the family. The mother we sent to the county hospital on our first visit, then one by one as they became ill. There are two members left in this family, a 17-year-old boy and a 19-year-old girl who have come to live with relatives. In addition, despite attempts by some of the most influential and well-respected physicians to find a cure for the flu or a vaccine to present it, Americans, most between the ages of 20 to 40 years old, died by the thousands. In Chicago, there were over 38,000 cases of flu and over 13,000 cases of pneumonia, which we have found out is, was really ARDS, um, acute respiratory distress. By November 16, more than 8,000 people had died. By the time the pandemic subsided, it had killed over 675,000 Americans and over 40 million worldwide. It was the worst pandemic in history. Next slide. The confluence of several factors, including the war and the nursing shortage, the efforts of the American Red Cross and the United States Public Health Service, and the use of volunteers all shaped the nursing response to pandemic influenza in 1918. Each community had to rely on its own resources as the flu devastated towns and city as it crossed in waves across the country. Indeed, nurses led their communities in the effort to provide home care to thousands of patients. They did so with minimal federal support, relying on an emergent community response. Clearly, it was the nurses' leadership as well as their cooperation with physicians, military personnel, the Army School of Nursing, and the American Red Cross and the United States Public Health Service that was essential to saving those lives that could be saved. Next slide. In the COVID pandemic today, many of these themes are recurring. By now, we are all too familiar with the reaction of the federal government in February, telling us everything was well in hand. We are also familiar with images from New York City during the early months of the COVID pandemic. Nurses having to make their own masks and wearing trash bags when there was a shortage of equipment. And the iconic image of the comfort sailing into New York Harbor, bringing help from the military. Today, we have high tech and high, highly scientific care, yet over 213,000 Americans have died. Poverty, living conditions, and underlying health conditions all play a role in the severity of the disease. But today, as was true in 1918, there is one consistent message. Masks can prevent the spread of this deadly disease. That was true in 1918, and it may be our best prevention today. I just wanted to point out my grandchildren in Oak Park. They're wearing their masks. Thank you very much, and we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Arlene and Gwyneth. Um, if, if people want to submit their questions now via the chat field, please do so. Uh, let's see. I do have one question now from Marilyn James. Uh, sorry about that. My video is not starting. There you go. Uh, do you know if uh, nursing students and nurses were paid? Um. Gwyneth, do you want to answer that? Uh, so, yeah, so the Army nurses were paid. Um, they were contracted employees of the U.S. Army, and the nursing students were not paid. Their, their payment was the education and eventual um, certification as a nurse. All right. Uh, question two from Peggy Burhan. Uh, what is pneumonia jacket? 
Um, a pneumonia jacket is kind of like a short um, robe or bed jacket to keep your chest and upper body warm when you're um, when you sit up in bed. Okay. Uh, question three, in those days, did they understand that face masks were more helpful in the preventing spread of the disease to others than in protecting oneself? They really didn't know. Um, they just used them. <laughs> they were uh, into the germ theory it had just been discovered and um, it probably was more effective in the operating rooms for bacteria than it was for a virus that was so tiny, but I think it was the best they could do. All right. Uh, can you recommend sources for more information on incidence, prevalence, morbidity, and mortality of the Spanish flu? Yes, uh, there's John Barry's book, um, The Great Flu, or uh, Alfred Crosby's book. Um, I can't remember the, the great pandemic, I guess. Um, and there's an article that I wrote, it's in, there's the whole supplement to public health nursing uh, or public health reports, 2010, which provides a series of articles by Jeffrey Taubenberger, myself, um, Marion Moser Jones. Um, so the whole supplement to the 2010 public health reports. I can also send that article to you to be alert to the necessities of the emergency to be sent around if you want to. That would be great. Or Gwyneth may already have it. Uh, what should we have learned from the 1918 pandemic that we should have reflected on for COVID-19 to decrease, decrease spread besides masks? Everything. <laughs> we should have been prepared. I have been talking about this since 20 probably 2004. Um, and of course, when we met, our committee met in uh, at the University of Michigan talking about the preparation for flu in 2009 when it, H1N1 broke out, but we certainly need a uh, pandemic flu response or, or pandemic response in the United States. Um, we need to mobilize federal resources earlier we need to have a consistent messaging from the government and the experts. Um, yeah, it kind of goes on. We should have learned a lot. We would have thought we would have, right? Um, mm -hmm. was, was there a political issue and were masks seen as being for weak people and not for strong, healthy individuals? I didn't find that in any of my research. I, yeah, I didn't see that either. It seemed like um, they did feel like masks were only needed for people that were ill, though. So I don't think the concept of like an asymptomatic or a pre-symptomatic person could spread the infection had really caught on. Um, but I don't, I don't know if it was seen as for necessarily for weak people. There was um, the government, uh, President Wilson didn't want to let people know that we had to deal with flu. This is why they called it the Spanish flu too, because the Germans didn't want to say it or the French that anybody had flu to, because they're in the middle of a war. Um, and they didn't stop crowding soldiers together to go to Europe in large ships, which was a problem. The difference- Go ahead, Arlene. The difference between um, now and then, of course, is that it was mostly affecting 20 to 40 year olds and young pregnant women. Uh, they would often have premature deliveries, their babies would die, children would die. Then um, what's different from today is the old people had some immunity because in 1893, there had been a flu outbreak. So the elderly had probably been exposed to that and Anyway, they didn't die. And the young people have hardy immune systems. So the immune response and um, acute respiratory distress syndrome with the cytokine storm was what was killing them. How interesting it's so flipped now, right? With yeah. the I think um, people would take it much more seriously today if their 20 year olds were dying, you know, or they might still, I guess. 
All right, another question um, from Lori Quinn. Do you know of information about the long-term effects and long-term complications of the flu? I do. Um, the nurses had to set up follow-up clinics in a lot of the towns and cities because people were losing their hair. They were very weak, uh, weak in muscles and uh, short of breath. So there were a lot of complications. Do you know any more, Dr. Miller? Um, I was just gonna say it was also compounded a lot by kind of the social conditions in which people lived. So the it took a lot longer for people to recover because their bodies were depleted of all their resources after you know fighting off the infection, and then they were malnourished and they didn't you know it was winter, so they were cold, and um, it was it was just really hard for them to recover afterwards. All right. Do we have any other questions? Um, looks like that might be it. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Killing and Dr. Milgrath so much for a truly informative session. Um, and thanks to you all for joining us today for Alumni Reunion 2020. Uh, we hope you enjoyed yourself and found many moments of value to carry away with you. Please keep an eye out on your email in the coming week we'll be sending a note with a link to a survey requesting your feedback on today's events. Um, also, please keep an eye out for our Vital Science Magazine, uh, chock full of stories from our college community over, the pa over this past very strange year. Please visit go.uic.edu forward slash nursing alum events to learn about our new webinar series called On Duty. The next one is scheduled for November 19th featuring our faculty, Rebecca Singer, who has been a leader in our college's response to the COVID crisis. If today you felt a pride in UIC nursing that makes you wish to support the college's students and faculty in a material way, please learn how to do so by visiting go.uic.edu forward slash give to nursing. Lastly, on behalf of myself, my colleagues in the Office of Advancement and Dean Terry Weaver, I thank you all for choosing to be with us today. We look forward to seeing you again soon, hopefully in person. Take care. <laughs>